Welcome to our Catechism class. It's a weekly look at the Heidelberg Catechism to help you learn Christian doctrine with a warm and practical application. Each lesson has its own study guide, and the web link to find that guide can be found in the episode notes. Okay, let's start the lesson. For a few moments uh, this evening, I want to address an issue that has beset us over the past few weeks here in Northern Ireland, and an issue that has clouded much of our social media, and an issue that will confront us in the days that lie ahead, the very immediate days that lie ahead. What is the Christian attitude to the Sabbath? You will immediately say, but you didn't read any verses about the Sabbath. No, I didn't. Because I imagine that you know more about the Sabbath than me. And I imagine that you know more about uh, the theology surrounding the Lord's Day than I do. And I also imagine that some of us may have slightly different views on Sabbatarianism. What we will agree on is that there are Christian priorities as far as the Lord's Day is concerned. And so for a few minutes tonight, I just want to look at some of those priorities and to examine them. So why did I start in Psalm 40? I thought that was a good place to start. In Psalm 40 and verse 8, we read these words. I delight to do thy will, O my God. Yea, thy law is written within my heart. Thy law is within my heart. And that's interesting. I have long been pondering what happens when a person is redeemed within them. Of course, we know what happens. They're given new life. They're given redemption. They are born again. There are all sorts of descriptions in the Bible about what happens when a person becomes a believer. But in evangelicalism today, none of those things seem to be emphasized. Um, Someone posted recently on on a Facebook page, what a wonderful change in my life has been wrought since Jesus came into my heart. There is life in my soul, which no lo- so long I had sought since Jesus came into my heart. And the impression seems to be that becoming a Christian is something that makes you joyous and happy all the time. That you are always full of the joys of spring. And I'm so happy, 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 so very, very happy. And I'm going to tell you something tonight. If you are, there is something seriously wrong with your personality. Because the man who is happy and joyful and happy, clappy every day of the week, every day of the year, has some kind of a personality disorder. You need to go and see the doctor. Something wrong with you. See, we don't be like that. And to say that when we become a believer, that what happens to us is that we cease to be sad and we cease to get down and we don't have depression anymore and we don't have illness and we don't have difficulties is to make a great mistake. But look at this verse again. Verse 8. I delight to do thy will, O my God. Why can we delight to do the Lord's will? Why would that be the case? Because thy law is within my heart. And there's a difference. There is the biblical teaching on what happens after conversion. Because in our unconverted, unregenerate state, we are rebellious against God. We are lawbreakers. We do not wish to keep God's law, and we have no desire within us to keep God's law. We are in rebellion in every single part of our being. We are totally depraved. We are not necessarily as sinful as we can be, because there are people, you will say, who are more sinful than I am. How can I be totally depraved? I can be totally depraved in the sense that the sin that I have affects every core part of my being. My will and my mind and my actions and my thoughts, all of my 
being is affected by my sin. I am in total rebellion against God in my unregenerate state. When we are converted, when the Holy Spirit has brought us to the point of conviction of sin, and we have had our eyes opened by God, and we have trusted Christ and begun a life of humble, repentant obedience to him, confession of sin, humble walk, humble walk before the Lord, delighting to do thy will. The difference is that instead of willingly and openly and blatantly flouting God's law, we want, we want to obey God's law. And when we don't obey God's law that is written in our hearts, we are convicted of that. We're sorrowful for it. We turn from it. It, it, it bothers us. And we repent of it and ask for forgiveness. I delight to do thy will, O God. Yea, thy law is within my heart. I want to, as a Christian, I want to honor the Lord. Not, to, not in order to obtain salvation, but because of the wonderful things that the Lord has done for me. Because, as the psalmist says, he has put a new song into my mouth, and even praise to my God. And Because he has done many, many wonderful works for me. Because the thoughts that he has towards me, the plans that he, the plan of redemption that he put in place for us, they cannot even be reckoned us by up by us, even if we were capable of summing and adding up all that the Lord has done for us, we would still never be able to number them. And yet we find ourselves accurately described in God's word. And we delight to do thy will. And we can only do that because of the work of God within us. And because God's law is written in our hearts, this is where I want to start, because the Sabbath and the keeping of the Sabbath is part of God's law for us. And it's in God's law, the third use of the law, that use of the law that shows us what is God's perfect will and how we are to walk in it. It is in that use of the law that we find our model for Christian living. So, when we approach the Sabbath, we approach it from those basic premises. We approach the Sabbath day wanting to please the Lord. We approach the Sabbath day because in our conversion, he has made us want to conform to his will. Our hearts and our minds and our wills are renewed so that we want to do what God wants us to do. We want to be obedient to him. And we want to please him in our walk. And we want to know how will we live on the Sabbath day in such a way as will please the Lord. For we delight to do thy will. I've only got two answers to that question. And they are very broad principles. And I will leave the nitty gritty to you. But you... I will no doubt agree with me on these two basic principles. And the first is this. That the Sabbath day, the Lord's day, is the day that we are required to discharge our Christian duties. And the second principle, broad principle, is that the Sabbath day, the Lord's day, is a day that is given to us by God as a blessing to prepare us for eternity. Now let's explore those two things for a few moments. Well, first of all, the Sabbath day involves our Christian duties. Now what do I mean by that? Well, I want you to look with me please for a wee minute at 1 Corinthians chapter 16. Right at the very end of 1 Corinthians, Paul has given instructions to the church and he's going to collect the offering. And he's going to give some very, very good advice on how that's to be done. And look at one of the pieces of advice that he gives concerning this Christian duty. Because this offering is not an offering for to buy the pastor a new jet. Or it's not an offering to build a great big massive cathedral. This is an offering to help 
those who are in need. And he says in chapter 16 and verse 1, Now concerning the collection for the saints, as I have given order to the churches of Galatia, even so do ye upon the first day of the week, let every one of you lay by him in store, as God hath prospered him. Let there be no gatherings when I come. And when I come, whomsoever ye shall approve by your letters, them will I send to bring your liberality unto Jerusalem. And if it be meet that I go also, then they shall go with me. Some very good advice there on, on financial probity in the ministry. But leaving that aside, in verse 2, Paul clearly instructs the church that this Christian duty was to be enacted on the Lord's day. And my assertion to my my suggestion to you tonight is that the Lord's day is the day when we will discharge first and foremost our Christian duties. That's because it's the day when the Christians would meet. There's a reason why this offering was to be taken on the first day of the week. For in the New Testament, that was the day when the Christians met. In John chapter 20 and verse 19, for example, at the same time in evening, being the first day of the week, when the doors were shut, where the disciples were assembled for fear of the Jews, came Jesus, stood in their midst. Paul, in Acts chapter 20 and verse 7, we read of that on the first day of the week, when the disciples came together to break bread, Paul preached unto them. Doesn't that remind you of the simple nature of a Christian service, of word and sacrament? And doesn't John say in Revelation chapter 1, that I was in the Spirit on the Lord's day, the day that the Christians met. And that was the day that Paul had said to the Corinthian church, this is the day that you will discharge your Christian duties. There's some interesting wording here. I need to be brief. There's some interesting wording here. As you look again at, at, at Chapter 16 and verse 2. It says, upon the first day of the week. And that's very important. We want to concentrate on that just for a wee moment. That's there for a reason. In fact, when you look at the Greek text here, it's a very interesting wording. It's kata myon sabaton. The upon the first Sabbath of the week, as opposed to the first day of the week. Remember that the Jews were, this was written in, in the context of a, of a culture that knew of, of, of Jewish, Jewish Sabbaths, uh, Judaistic Sabbaths. The last day of the week was the Sabbath. But here we're made, made very clear to us that this Christian duty, when the church would meet together to perform this obligation before the Lord, was to be not on the Sabbath that the Jews celebrated, the last one, but on the first day, the first Christian Sabbath. People will say to you, why do you still refer to the Lord's day as the Sabbath? Because it is the Christian Sabbath. It was the first day of the week, the giving of the offering along with the worshipping of the church, was to be on the Sabbath day, which occurred on the first day, the Christian Sabbath, the first day of the week, and it was to be part of our worship. So, there's a case here to be made that a general principle is that our Christian duties and obligations to the congregation and before the Lord are going to take precedence on the Sabbath day. Now, what are those Christian duties? Well, I'm going to suggest to you that one of those Christian duties is the maintenance of Christian worship and teaching. The maintenance of Christian worship and teaching. You wonder why we come together like this. A funeral director said to me a few way, a wee way back, do you still preach every Sunday in Bally Macashan? 
And I said, I do. Is there still only half a dozen of you? I says, there is. He says, why do you keep going there? Well, here's the reason. Because it is our duty as believers on the Sabbath day to make sure that the correct worship of God is maintained. If we didn't hold our service on the Lord's day in Ballymacashan, what would we be left with? Down the road, Unitarians, one of the other churches, the Prayers Band, the maintenance of Christian worship. Very, very important. And if no one else joins us, we must continue to do that. It's a great, uh, it's a great importance. In fact, in Titus chapter 1 and verse 5, we're taught that one of the reasons that Paul ordained elders in the churches was to set in order and to maintain order in Christian worship. Our jobs, our, our calling is not just to preach the gospel, but to order worship in accordance with the, with the principles of God's word. We call it the regulative principle of worship. In 1 Corinthians chapter 9, Paul writes again, he talks about himself, and he talks about the salary of the pastor. There's an interesting thing. If we have sowed unto you spiritual things, it is a great thing if we shall reap unto you carnal, if we shall reap from you carnal things. 1 Corinthians 9, verse 11 to 12. If others be partakers of this part over you, are we not rather? There were some people in the church at Corinth who were on a salary as a pastor. And Paul says, I deserve that too. I deserve it. I should be, I'm, I'm, bringing you spiritual blessings, and you should be supporting my ministry. And yet, having established that principle, here's what he says. Nevertheless, we have not used this part, but suffered all things, lest we should hinder the gospel of Christ. There's another thing. People say to me, why, why do you keep preaching every week in Ballymacashan when they can't pay you for it? Why is it well, you, could go, you could go and get a church somewhere and, and you could be employed and have a manse uh, and you wouldn't have to go out and do a day's work all through the week? Well, it is our job to protect worship. It's not our job to draw a salary. It is our job to preserve the worship of the Lord, lest we should hinder the gospel of Christ. Now, do you see that? One of our Christian obligations is that we should never do anything to hinder the gospel. Last week, I spoke to a minister of our largest denomination here in Northern Ireland, a man who is, by all accounts, an evangelical. Knowing him to be a fond cyclist, I just said to him, he came over to me at a funeral, and I shook hands with him. The funeral I was attending of a friend, friend's mother. And I, he came over to me, and I shook hands. And uh, he asked me how I was keeping. He was all smiles and happy to see him. Did you enjoy your wee cycle race last week? Says I. I did. It was great. It was that the one that closed down our Lord's Day afternoon service? The roads were all closed, you know. Oh, but it wasn't me it closed the roads. It was, uh, aye, but um, the free Presbyterians up the road from us couldn't have theirs either. Ah, well, you see, you see, you see, you see. Christians should do nothing and partake in nothing that would hinder the preaching of the gospel. If you take part in a bicycle race, and that bicycle race is held on the Lord's Day, and you're out racing with the Cyclists for Christ or any other organization you want to call it, and you're racing round past churches and the roads are closed and the people can't get to their worship, then you are hindering the gospel. And Paul said, I would rather suffer personal loss. I would rather do without my food and my, and my, my wages than ever hinder the gospel of Christ. And you can't even do without a ride in your bicycle. It's a Christian duty. 
that we should do nothing on the Sabbath day that would ever cause hurt to the worship of Almighty God who created us and who gave his son to die for us. It's more important than anything else. It takes preference over everything. What else? Fellowship with believers is a Christian duty. Fellowship with believers. I'm fond of the Heidelberg Catechism. And the Catechist, in one of the the versions of the Catechism, puts it like this. Go to church. That's our Christian duty, to diligently go to church. What a blessing it is just to go to church, just to associate with God's people, just to get away from our everyday surroundings and to be in a place where our common focus is the Lord Jesus Christ who has redeemed us through his own precious blood shed on the cross for sinners. What a blessing that is. Oh, I was glad when they said unto me, let us go to the house of the Lord. Fellowship with believers is a Christian duty that should not be neglected. After all, in the book of Acts, doesn't it tell us um, that the disciples met and they continued steadfastly in the apostles' doctrine and fellowship and breaking of bread and in prayers? The Christian's duty is to do nothing that would hinder the, the worship of the Lord, the teaching of Holy Scripture. The Christian's duty is to go to church, not to sit at home on the Lord's day. Now you can say, well, sure, I might as well go to the river, get peace and quiet, and I can commune with God. I don't know whether you can or not. I've never tried it. Go to church. Have fellowship with other believers. There's another duty, and it's to actively hear the word of God because the Christian's duty is not just to hear God's word, but to learn it so that it will be in our hearts. After all, faith cometh by hearing and hearing by the word of God. And I think it is marvelous that God has given us his word and he has given us his day a day that we can come together and we can open the Bible and we can read his word. Thank God that we have services in our churches where we sing God's word in Psalms, where we, where we pray through God's word, where we read God's word in our services, where we preach sermons that are based on God's word. For there are too many places today where the service on the Lord's day is based around someone's private revelation or some book they've read or where they read one wee verse and then go off at a total tangent. The Christian's duty is to maintain worship, to go to church, to actively hear God's word, to participate in the sacraments. And of course, that would be part of that because the ministry is the ministry of the word and the sacrament. And the sacraments are most properly administered in the context of the church on the Lord's day. When Paul instructs us on the Lord's supper in 1 Corinthians chapter 11, he adds in verse 33, wherefore my brethren, when ye come together to eat, tarry one for another. And as I've already quoted in the book of Acts chapter 20, there Paul preached to midnight and they came together to break bread and to hear the word of God. Participation in the sacraments, corporate prayer. That's another duty. Somebody will say, I can pray in my own prayer, private room. You can, but you're to come together to pray, to corporately pray together. And instances of it are very well documented of the Bible. And it's most suited to the Sabbath day. And of course, as we've already seen, the giving of offerings for the needs of others and for the Lord's work. Is a Christian duty. Now, all of those Christian duties that we are required to do are part of our priority on the Lord's day, and they come before everything else. There's nothing else 
that can shake those things. We must put those things first as believers if we want to please the Lord. The second point then is that our Sabbath is not only is it a question of getting our priorities right spiritually, but it is very much a preparation for eternity. Uh, and again, the Catechist in the Heidelberg Catechism, with its very finely balanced, moderately reformed viewpoint, puts it very well. For the Catechist says here, secondly, that all the days of my life I will rest from my evil works. Let the Lord work in me through his Holy Spirit. And so begin in this life, the eternal Sabbath. I'm going to suggest that the the Lord's day is for us a day of recuperation. It's a day when we draw aside from all our evil works. And what can our works be? How can they be evil? How can that be the case? I mean, we all have a day's work to do. I have to do it. I spend the whole week working and working in the studio in Dundonald, working in various places, taking photographs out. You'll see me sometimes doing some very strange things. A few weeks ago, I was standing on top of a porta cabin in the pouring rain, taking photographs of a car park. And I'm thinking to myself, somebody will think I'm a nutcase. Why am I standing in this porta cabin in the rain? I'm getting paid for it. Good enough reason to do it. But it couldn't really be called evil, could it? And when you think of all the good works it's done, nurses working in hospitals, people helping the dying, helping the sick, giving aid to others, how can that be called evil? Well, you see, all of our deeds, all of our righteousness is like filthy rags before the Lord. We're comparing ourselves with other men. I look at myself and I say, you know, my work is really not all that bad. I I do it unto the Lord to the best of my ability. And I frequently use it to bless others as best as I can. Uh, And very often when people come and and contact with me through my work, I get witnessing and talking to them. And God help me if I don't take those opportunities. But compared with a murderer whose work is evil. How could my work ever be evil? But yet even my best works in this world are tainted and tinged with my sin, and before God they would be swept away into eternity. There's only one perfect work, and that work is Christ's work. Christ's work on the cross, perfect for us. So laying aside the distinction of piety and necessity and mercy and all of that stuff, all of our works, all of our righteousness, all is filthy rags. So on the Lord's day, let us put those things aside and let us focus our mind on him whose work for us was the perfect work. And the reason for that is that all of our works will one day be Finished. I want you to turn to the book of Hebrews, chapter 4. Probably a passage that we have looked at before, but I'm interested in verse 9. Hebrews chapter 4 and verse 9. There remaineth therefore a rest to the people of God. The Hebrew author here is directly comparing the Sabbath rest with our eternal rest. There's a rest still to come. There remaineth therefore a rest to the people of God, for he that has entered into his rest, listen, he hath ceased from his own works, as God did from his. One day, we will cease from our works and our eternal rest. One day, everything will be gone. One day, the works that we have built up, the reputation that we have as a tradesman or a professional or whatever, all that will be gone. All of the tools of our trade that we use will be gone. I'm very, very blessed because I love the tools of my trade. I love the cameras and I love the lights and I'm very happy with it. I I love 
getting out to, to, to a location. I love the feel of the, of the Nikon camera in my hand and the thought that mine costs about 20 times what somebody else's did. That all blesses me. I feel great about it. One day I lay it down forever. Sometimes you think to yourself, you know, what's that all about? You build up a business or you get your degree, you have your education, you build your home and you build your family. As we sang in one of the Psalms, one day it's all going to be taken from us. We lay it all aside and we rest from our labors. Do you know the Sabbath day is a preparation for that? The Sabbath day is given to us to prepare us for our eternal rest. We should not be doing our labours. We should not be working. So now I'm not nitpicking here. Somebody said to me one day, you shouldn't drive a van on the Lord's day because that's work. You can drive your car, don't drive your van. That's, 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 that's silly. But on the Sabbath day, we prepare for our eternal rest. We lay aside all of our less than perfect works so that as we shall do in eternity, we will consider Christ. Give us time to think about his work. The Sabbath is a day of recuperation. And we will spend time with God's people in God's house and his day and his presence when we shift our focus from earth to heaven to eternity. It's a day of recuperation and it's a day of recuperation that will assist us in our sanctification. For the Lord will work in us through through his Holy Spirit. The purpose of our sanctification The purpose of the ongoing work of the Holy Spirit within us is to prepare us for heaven, to make us more Christ-like, to bring us to the place, to prepare us for the day when we shall be with the Lord in glory, when that work in us will be fully realized and perfected. And on the Lord's day, As we perform our Christian duties before God, the Holy Spirit is working in us, preparing us for eternity. So it's a day of rest and recuperation to assist in our sanctification as a means of our preparation. There remaineth therefore a rest for the people of God, for he that is entered into his rest He also hath ceased from his own works, as God did from his. So to prepare for that rest, on the Sabbath day, we cease from our own works, that God may do his work in us. So apart from the physical and well-being benefits that are given to all of mankind, remember the Sabbath is a creation ordinance. It's given to all mankind to be a blessing. For the Christian it holds special significance. The purpose of the Sabbath for the believer is quite simply that we would do our Christian duties in the house of the Lord on his day so that he might, through his work within us, prepare us for the Sabbath rest that is yet to come. Thank you for listening. If you've enjoyed this episode of the podcast, please help to make it better known by opening the podcast app on your phone or mobile device. Then, search for The Semper Reformata Podcast. Subscribe and give it a 5-star rating. See you next time.